Daphne Galizia, Malta's best known and most controversial journalist, was murdered on Monday when her car exploded shortly after she left her home on the island. The murder of Maltese journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia in October of 2017 brought international attention to corruption in Malta and the freedom of journalists across the EU. It also brought increased scrutiny to a certain type of lawsuit used to threaten and silence journalists. Daphne Caruana Galizia faced more than 40 of these suits at the time of her death. My mother was used as an example. People who simply didn't want criticism of their of the way they conducted their business or the way they ran their political party um, would use my mother to set an example. These lawsuits weaponized the justice system in order to muzzle watchdogs, whistleblowers, and journalists. They curate the information that becomes public, keep corruption concealed, and stifle democratic participation. The human rights situation is worsening globally and that is why it's important that we hold all those accountable that violate human rights. Islam is the real problem that we face in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium, in all of Europe. The independence of the judges in Hungary is one of the best in the European Union. <laughs> we need the tripod of democracy, respect for human rights, respect for the rule of law. Welcome to the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, where we explore human rights and democracy issues across the EU. I'm Jonathan Day. In this episode, I talk to Matthew Caruana Galizia, the son of murdered Maltese journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia, about the abusive lawsuits that made his mother's life, in his words, quote, impossible. And Linda Rabo from the Civil Liberties Union for Europe talks about what the EU can do to protect journalists, watchdogs, and other activists from these vexatious lawsuits. These vexatious lawsuits are called SLAPs, an acronym for Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation. They're used against journalists, activists, and others in order to silence them or stop unwanted investigations. The threat is straightforward. SLAPs are civil lawsuits that seek exorbitant financial damages for exaggerated or even baseless claims. They are most often initiated by powerful people or businesses against much smaller, less secure entities, often individual reporters, to scare them into silence. The way slaps work uh, is that basically they are designed as very expensive lawsuits um, that are meant to drag on proceedings for years. Linda Rabo is a senior advocacy consultant with the Civil Liberties Union for Europe and an expert on the use of slaps in the EU. And the aim of this lawsuit is not actually to assert um, you know, a right or a genuine claim, but rather to really start abusive court proceedings and, and bring to court uh, the targets in a way that you know, they, they lose their time and energy in defending themselves against these abusive lawsuits instead of working on uh, the things that they care about and that we care about, because these lawsuits are actually aimed at targeting what we call public participation behaviors. So all the work of those public watchdogs, or journalists, activists, rights defenders that are there and, and work to expose um, wrongdoings and, and malpractices. But don't imagine big courtroom scenes of lawyers and witnesses locked in a fiery cross-examination. That's because even the people who file slaps don't want them to go to trial. That's because they don't actually seek to assert a legitimate claim. But by going after investigative journalists, rights groups, environmental groups, and whistleblowers, slaps have an extremely negative effect on our democracy. Slaps are aimed at uh, con converting matters of public interest into technical sort of private law disputes. And this already has a very negative effect on, on free speech and our, so our citizens' rights to information because it turns people's attention from the issue at stake, so from the public um, uh, matter that was the object of uh, the investigation, the report, uh, whatever, uh, to the credibility of the slap target. So people who were previously supportive of your work, including, for example, your employers, might begin to question it. And, and you may eventually agree to end your campaign, research, investigation or reporting because of that, if you become uh, the target of, a, of an abusive lawsuit. <laughs> 
The longer this pressure can be applied, the more an employer or readers or supporters will question the work or reputation of a slap victim, and the more legal fees that that person needs to pay, the better. The slowness of the legal system is weaponized by slap suits, and it gives the claimant more time to constantly harass their target. When a slap is actually filed, uh, the slap bully will normally try and drag it on for years. So even if the action is eventually dismissed, during the litigation, the plaintiff will harass the target by demanding access to emails, computer files, uh, you know, trying to expose details of uh, professional and personal life of the target. And, and the slap will force the target to, well, first of all, pay thousands of, of euros in legal fees, not to talk about the waste of um, energy and time defending him or herself from the losses. And all this will basically prevent the slap target from working on the issues that they were working on or they care about. Daphne Caruana Galizia knew better than almost anyone of the effects slaps can have on one's work and life. Because for all the damage they do to democracy, free media, and public participation, the consequences of slaps are, of course, most acute for the victims themselves. My mother told my brother, they're trying to fry me alive. Those were her words. That's Matthew Caruana Galizia, whom you heard in the intro. He's Daphne's son and currently the director of the foundation that bears his mother's name. I spoke with him about the effects slaps had on his mother's work and life and the lives of other journalists. The most egregious example I can think of out of many is when my mother was sued 19 times at one go. So 19 defamation lawsuits were filed against her all at once by the same person. And my mother had to pay around 8,000 euros just to to file a, a document saying that she was contesting the claims. If she didn't do that, then she would have lost by default and she would have had to pay whatever damages were awarded. But in addition to the financial costs, slaps have a huge personal cost to the victims. These lawsuits, apart from the cost, simply make your life one of constant anxiety, where instead of thinking about your work, instead of thinking about your investigation, instead of thinking about your children, your family, your life, you're constantly worrying about the libel suits. The other day, I spoke to a journalist um, at Forbes, who told me, look, I don't want to talk about that period when he was threatened with a defamation suit because he said it was the most stressful period of my life. More stressful than the death of my parents, more stressful than a divorce, more stressful than anything. And they absolutely didn't want to talk about it. So we can say that these threats actually are are a cause of trauma in journalists, they're so traumatic that they simply never want to talk about them again. They don't want to talk about the the investigation itself ever again. They don't want to talk about the person that they were investigating at the time, the person who was threatening them. They even abandon journalism and move into something completely different. And this is in fact the purpose of them. The purpose of the lawsuits is not to set the record straight or Um, to make a point or anything like that. I mean, it's simply to make your life so impossible that you decide to give in. You say, look, it's not worth it. I'm going to retract the article or I'm going to make a forced apology, even though there is no basis for an apology. And the, the bully gets their way. And individual journalists are often targeted specifically because they themselves would not have the resources to pay damages. Slaps, but also only the threat of slaps, uh, is used to explicitly blackmail the victim and by uh, their silence. Linda Rabo. So one of the key elements of a slap is the disparity of power and resources between the bully and the victim. Um, and slap target, especially when they're freelance journalists or, uh, you know, lone uh, activists, uh, are mostly, of course, not in the position to get assistance and let alone to face the costs of this litigation. 
But even when journalists do have some means to fight off slaps, the system seems stacked against them. Matthew's mother was hit with slaps from bankers, hoteliers, and even Maltese politicians. Politician Chris Cardona, who filed numerous slap suits against Daphne Caruana Galizia, got banks to freeze her accounts. The, the people who filed the, the lawsuits against my mother, in this case, Chris Cardona and his advisor or consultant, um, used this mechanism, what, what's called a lien in the US, um, to prevent, to freeze my mother's bank account. So they said, okay, we're suing Daphne Caruana Galizia for 20,000, actually it was more like 30,000 euros. And this is, this is what we're claiming in damages. Now, in the expectation that they win these lawsuits, they said, we want to freeze up to that amount in Daphne Caruana Galizia's bank accounts. And the court granted this freezing of my, it authorized or ordered the freezing of my mother's bank accounts up to that amount. So my mother was left unable to pay for anything. She was robbed of access to her, to her savings, to her current account. But rather than becoming null and void upon his mother's murder, Matthew says the family inherited the libel cases that had been opened against her. We're still fighting them. I think we're down to about six cases, something like that, from 46. So there were 46 civil defamation cases and five criminal. The five criminal dropped immediately upon my mother's murder because that's the law. You can't prosec- criminally prosecute someone who's dead. Um, but the civil defamation cases remained. And we've reduced them with the help of an organization based in the Netherlands called Free Press Unlimited to about six cases. <laughs> On, on slap laws, uh, suing journalists from defamation. This is a shameful story. I will be mapping all the possible situations of the uh, uh, abuse of litigations against the journalists. I will look into the possibility of coming with some proposals in the inter- international private law, and we will be considering some aid, some legal aid, or some, some funding for the journalists who suffer from such abuse abuse of law. That's Vera Yurova, currently European Commission Vice President, speaking in 2019. The EU has been slow to act against slaps, even though their use is becoming more and more frequent. Poland's second biggest newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, has received more than 55 legal threats and lawsuits by a number of actors, including from Poland's ruling party, since 2015. Companies affiliated with France's Ballora Group have blanketed journalists and NGOs in libel suits to stop them from covering its business interests in Africa. In Spain, meat producer Corin is demanding 1 million euros in damages from an environmental activist who criticized its waste management practices. But with the threat of slaps becoming clearer, Linda Rabo says the EU could soon act against the abuse of lawsuits. Her organization, the Civil Liberties Union for Europe, is part of a coalition of organizations pressuring the EU to finally pass anti-slap regulations. The coalition is called CASE, or Coalition Against Slaps in Europe. Our focus uh, in Europe uh, has been um, EU um, institutions and policymakers, because we do think that indeed the EU is in a key position to fill this gap. Um, in, in fact, there is no legislation in countries across Europe uh, on slaps, whereas anti-slap status exists. In, in other regions uh, of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, all those, those safeguards that exist in, in some uh, member states are, are, are clearly limited and there is no uniformity of protection. So uh, we are focusing on uh, asking the EU to take action um, so that there are strong uh, safeguards and uh, remedies uh, across the EU member states that can be established and can be available to victims uh, equally. But the EU, as with most things, moves cautiously. There is debate about how to structure such a law, its scope, and even the extent to which EU law could regulate the issue. 
So Case took it upon themselves to write a model law to help guide the EU. We thought of working on this model EU anti-slap law uh, that we published uh, back in December last year to show first the EU that EU rules are at reach. Uh, but also advice on how this legislation could and should look like based on, uh, you know, a number of legislative solutions that we took from existing anti-slap laws uh, that proved to be best practices um, uh, in, in those jurisdictions that we looked at. Um, and, and this model EU law, um, we, we launched it at the, at the time where uh, the European Commission was publishing uh, their new initiative uh, to protect democracy in the EU, what they call the EU Action Plan on Democracy, to demand that uh, the EU takes concrete action uh, to counter slaps because of the threats they pose to democracy. The coalition wants a regulation that not only supports slap victims, but also disincentivizes the use of slaps. And the rules must apply equally across the EU. What we propose, you know, is a number of um, harmonized uniform rules that would apply across uh, the EU so that these abusive cases can be quickly dismissed uh, from courts, that slab bullies are penalized for, for bringing slabs, and that defendants, so victims, uh, see that they are given the necessary tools uh, and support to uh, resist to, to this abuse. Um, and we do hope that the EU can become a champion for EU member states, but also countries in wider Europe and adopt a similar law um, in the near future. Public pressure also helps. A petition is currently running to gather signatures in support of an EU anti-slap regulation. This is part uh, a bit of the, um, also the work that CASE is doing in terms of raising awareness about the phenomenon and, and really engaging and mobilizing people uh, around it. Um, so the petition has been launched a few weeks ago and it will remain open for sure uh, for the rest of the summer and um, in September. Um, and we aim at gathering thousands, we hope, of, of signatories uh, to, to gather support for our proposal um, for a model EU anti slap law. Uh, so for a, for, you know, a legislative proposal by the European Commission that goes along the lines of what we propose in our model EU anti slap law. Uh, and the call is directly on the commissioners uh, that are responsible to this, uh, so Eurova and, and Reinders. Um, and anybody can sign this petition, which is uh, online on a number of uh, websites of the uh, coalition's organizations and uh, that you also find uh, on the case uh, website in the campaigns page. That website is www.the-case.eu and it's linked in the description of this episode. For Matthew Caruana Galizia, who's worked with Linda and Case to help raise public awareness and advocate for an anti-slap law, such a thing would be a long time coming. But he says he's optimistic that it could soon be reality. So I am optimistic because the first step for us in the years immediately after the murder was to, to show people in institutions the wound to show that this was a problem across Europe and Europe is supposed to be a beacon for press freedom, for freedoms in general, globally. Yet European journalists were having to deal with these problems constantly. And they were often a reason why investigations were being abandoned, why media organizations were being shut down why journalists were giving up their work and moving into a different career path. This was simply not the way, or it was not the Europe that our politicians were promoting outside of the continent. So we eventually were able to, to, to get to the point where there was recognition within the European Parliament within European institutions that, yes, this is a problem and it has to be dealt with in some way. So I think we've, we've now gotten past the first hurdle and we're, we're dealing with the second stage, which is um, how to tackle this problem, how to 
how to kind of nip slaps in the in the bud and this makes me optimistic the fact that we were able to get to the second stage and to be sure the stakes are high the victims of slaps are often those people on the front line defending our rights or raising awareness about environmental destruction corruption or myriad other issues that threaten the free and open societies we want those watchdogs that slaps target are there to protect our democracy, are there to, you know, raise awareness and expose matters of public interest that uh, matter to us, um, to all of us. So um, public participation matters. Uh, and the work of these public watchdogs matters because without their work, we wouldn't be a, we wouldn't be able to you know shape well-informed opinions about um, things uh, that affect uh, our daily lives and our societies. Um, so yeah, this is why I think that we all uh, should care about uh, slaps. That's it for this episode of the Speechback Podcast by Liberties, a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe. 